Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of Judicial Examination Lecture Series 2021. It is an honor for me to welcome, on behalf of JGLS, our guest speaker for today, Professor Pragya Parijat Singh, who will be delivering the lecture on the Code of Civil Procedure 1908. Professor Singh has secured her BA and her LLB degrees from the University of Delhi. She recently completed her LLM from University of Cambridge. She has been practicing advocate at Supreme Court of India, as well as a panel counsel for the Union of India. She has represented as a counsel in certain landmark cases like decriminalization of begging in Delhi, re-inhuman condition of, of uh, 1382 prisoners in India, Polavaram Dam case, TN Godavaran case on forest rights, and Bandhua Mukti Mocha versus Union of India in 2019. She was also a partner at Unomia Law Associates and was also a legal counselor at Tihar Delhi prisons. She heads a trust by the name of Vidhi Varneyam. Uh, Professor, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Vidhi Varneyam. Vidhi Varneyam. Vidhi Varneyam Foundation, based in New Delhi, which aims at increasing legal literacy in the nation. She has been the recipient of MHRD Central Sector Scholarship from 2008 to 2013 and was recently awarded with the Marlitt Award for Personal Achievements by St. Edmunds College, University of Cambridge, in 2019-20. In her free time, she likes to travel, cook, or conduct legal awareness campaigns across Delhi. Professor Singh has not only appeared for competitive examinations herself, but also coached aspirants. Today, Professor Singh will be sharing her insights on the subject, the Code of Civil Procedure. Professor Singh will discuss important questions and how to approach them. I now humbly invite Professor Singh to deliver the lecture, after which I will be taking up your questions from the comment section in the last 15 minutes. Professor Singh, the floor is for you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tripti, uh, for such a gracious interview. Very kind of you. And a very good afternoon to all of you. I hope you all are doing well. And uh, all the more, uh, my heartfelt thanks uh, that you all are, uh, in a way, you know, utilizing the most of your Sunday. Usually, everyone is supposed to rest on Sunday afternoon. But uh, thank you for sparing time for this. And I'm sure uh, everyone who's attending uh, de definitely have plans to prepare for uh, judicial service examination. So uh, my only endeavor for the next 45 to 50 minutes would be uh, to share my experiences, my wisdoms, my learnings and unlearnings, whatever I have obtained uh, over a couple of years. Just give me one second, please. Yes. So uh, uh, having said that, uh, Let's talk about uh, the topic that we have been given today. Uh, since I'm teaching uh, Civil Procedure Code 1908 to the students of JGU, uh, usually in the first lecture, I ask them, what are your expectations from the subject or what have you heard about the subject? And most of them usually have a common or in unison, they say this thing that uh, the subject uh, is very dreaded and we've heard that it's very dry, it's very procedural, very technical and, uh, you know, not very uh, easy for a student to read all by their own. So criminal, criminal procedure code is something which is very interesting, it's quite intriguing. And just by the bare language of it, if you go through it, you'll be able to make out something from it, but it's not the same case with CPC. It does have certain rules. There is a proper coherence, there's a structure through which you approach this subject. Now let's also talk about the topic that has been given to us today. We are categorically speaking about the judicial services and what role does CPC plays in the judicial services examination. So as you all are aware that as of now, we do have uh, an all India uh, uh, Indian administrative services examination, but we don't have a AIJS, which is all India judicial services examination. However, in the 14th uh, uh, Law Commission report, uh, which dates back from the year 1958, the Law Commission had categorically said that Rajya Sabha should be given powers uh, 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 so as to start a AIJS. But imagine ever since 1958, and we are standing now in 2021, we still don't have an AIJS. However, there are strong chances that in the times to come, we might have an All India Judicial Service examination, thereby making judiciary furthermore strengthened. 
the powers of judges will definitely be increased. And in a way, just like administrative um, uh, services, judiciary will also be taken as somewhat like a spinal cord to how the country runs and how the country works. So if, if uh, um, uh, administrative services uh, are like blood, then judiciary acts like a spine because it's very important and combined together, uh, the system becomes enmeshed and you know this is how the country runs in a proper manner. Now, if we have an AIJS in the times to come, I think this is the most opportune time to start preparing in advance because you see strategy always reduces the risk. And I certainly believe with my own experiences that try to prepare in the most efficacious manner so that your first attempt is your last attempt. And whenever you are giving your first attempt, you should put all your efforts because the chances, the probability of clearing it is the highest at that time. Because eventually, if God forbid, and you are not able to clear, then some sort of you know complacency, some sort of uh, that uh, risk-taking factor, the the idea of failure starts uh, uh, you know um, pressurizing you back in your mind that what if I don't clear? What if I'm wasting another year? And that is how it is. These are competitive examination. I call them as negative exams because they're here to screen you out. They don't want to select you. They also they really want to, you know, uh, take the best of you, best amongst you. It doesn't make you a waste. Anything that you've studied all during these preparation years will, ne will never go waste. However, it's very important that you have to be very, very strategic in your preparation. And my takeaway from my year, since I wrote mains examination of IAS examination and uh, my optional was law, I wrote mains and I could not clear it. And after a period of time, after giving two years, I realized, plus I had my own personal reasons to leave it. Uh, so I thought that time is opportune when I should identify my niche. So the first thing that I would request all of you before you start preparing for competitive exams are whether you really want to appear for competitive exams. Are you doing it in peer pressure manner? Do you think that you don't have a lot of other options? So why not try my hands in this thing? So you have to be absolutely clear what you want to do and the preparation of IES or the preparation of competitive exams, including judicial services are two very different things. Even if you have a law optional for IES examination, the subject, the preparation is very different with that of judicial services examination. So since we are talking about judicial services examination here, we need to know that there is a major chunk of uh, uh, marks which is allocated to civil law papers including CPC and CRPC. So I'm sure all of you must be aware that law is basically categorized into two parts. The one is substantive law, another one is procedural law. I'm sure all of you must also be knowing that substantive law will not do without procedural law and all of them combined together work in tandem. What are the examples of substantive law? So we have IPC, we have the Grand Norm, which is the Constitution of India. They're made by the parliamentarians. However, procedural law are somewhat, it's a mix of both uh, substantive law plus procedural laws. They are made by uh, sub-parliamentary committees, administrative heads make them, and henceforth there are always chances of a lot of amendments. But you cannot really do without procedural laws. So if IPC provides uh, a, 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 a you know, structure to the body, it is the blood, which, is, which comes in the form of uh, CRPC, the provisions that can actually, you know, procedurally take step by step that combine together, it takes the form of substantive plus, plus procedural law. Now coming to CPC, you see CPC was made in the year 1908, way back when our country was under the British rule. And, you know, let's go again, 100 years uh, behind that, it was around 1859, 1860, that for the first time, it was felt by the Britishers who were presiding the small presidency courts uh, while they were listening to disputes. So any dispute which was civil in nature, which was not criminal in nature, uh, were to be heard by these judges. Now, there was a lot of, uh, you know, spatial differences. At one court, there was some other practice. At some another court, there was another way that was adopted. There was a lot of confusion. We did not have a universal law. So they thought that why not have a law that has applicability over the country and let's combine together, make it you know applicable, uh, its extent should be across the country. 
and henceforth over the period of time with several amendments we got this uh, statute which is called as the civil procedure code of 1908 anyone and everyone who has this apprehension that this paper is very dry is very technical let me tell you it is not it's the most beautiful subject ever and if at all anyone has done internship in the district court or a civil diwani court would really appreciate the beauty of this paper it is very logical it comes step by step and anyone who is a rational person sane minded person would know that this is how it happens step by step so you are a litigant who's fighting with somebody over a piece of land because you believe that person has taken away your land or is in illegal possession of that land now you want to take back that land what option do you have you are a litigant you are you you feel that you are you know legal right has been violated it was your land you uh, belong to that land and somebody has taken wrongful possession of that land from say from last three years now what do you do you go to the court of the nearest jurisdiction and there you institute a suit you have a complaint so you file a plaint and there after filing or institution of the suit the pleadings begin the court will give right to other party by informing them that hey a matter has been filed against you you need to defend because they are claiming that you have taken wrongful possession of that land now when this person comes to the court the pleadings are set to get over they are going to file their respective replies where rebuttals will be there where they will say that no i have done this or i have not done this based upon that evidences will be taken into consideration and trial is set to commence that is why they are called as trial courts they are not appellate court they are original trial courts where a matter is instituted for the first time so maximum time is given to a fresh matter in the trial courts whenever the trial is concluded comes the stage of judgment and after the judgment a decree is passed in favor of one and against another person this entire subject which has nearly 158 sections around 51 orders and a lot of rules combined together comes in the form of code of civil procedure now it is called as procedural law however the beauty is that it does have a portion of substantial law as well so it does have sections also and these sections are read together with orders and rules now what are rules very simple rules is any you know set of guidelines that have been made that you are supposed to follow so for example just like in criminal law if they are saying that there is a provision that if uh, a police officer has to arrest a woman who they believe has committed some sort of crime then it is expected that you are supposed to wear your uh, you know badge where your name should be written your uh, designation should be written you cannot go after sunset or before sunrise if you are going to arrest a woman <coughs> you need to have a lady officer with you so these are guidelines that have evolved over the period of time which combined together makes rules and when certain types of rules are combined together they are uh, formulated in the form of order and now these orders are read along with the sections now since i'm telling you that this has 158 sections it means that these sections were made by the parliamentarians to a proper procedure where the bill must have been introduced it should have been passed by both the houses so on and so forth now coming to preparation of all india judicial services examination with cpc as a subject so cpc is not the only subject that you are supposed to clear so if you are going to give ias exam you don't have to prepare for procedural law papers and that is why i say that ias preparation is very different from judiciary ias preparation does not involve uh, preparing procedural uh, papers like cpc crpc however if you are preparing for judiciary it is expected out of you to be uh, well acquainted with the procedural law if the total examination of any state concerned has for example 800 marks allocated in total to the entire preliminary mains and interview level trust me almost on an average of 200 to 250 marks is allocated only to procedural law that is cpc combined together with crpc almost 400 marks out of 800 is given to procedural law papers and that's why i'm saying and again and again emphasizing that by any chance by any hook or crook you cannot 
tend to avoid this subject. Now, what should be the proper strategy if you are preparing for uh, judicial services of different states? So again, like I said, first of all, you should know whether you really want to appear in judiciary or not. So, you know, uh, to each his own, some of us want to go into corporate, some of us want to go to litigation, some of us also want to prepare for competitive examination. You know, very elite services, very beautiful, has some sort of grace around it. And there is a certain demeanor around the judges. Even as a practicing advocate, uh, and what we have seen while growing up on television that, you know, Judge Sahab this, Judge Sahab that, my lords this, aisa nahi hota hai court mein. So if at all you are going to a court, you every time you go there inside or you go outside, you have to bow down and everyone is equal in front of that judge. Imagine that even in the 21st century, we are calling them my lords, thereby uh, comparing them equivalent to God, which is a very beautiful thing. It might have its own criticism, but let's look at the good side. Imagine the power, the immense power that has been bestowed upon to a judge that they are determining somebody's future, somebody's life, somebody's career. So that is why you are equating them, them as a just person, a person equivalent to God, and thereby we call them my lords or my ladyship. So this is how important these services are to protect the sovereignty of the country, to ensure rule of law, to you know, protect the supremacy of law. Judiciary will never lose its sheen, will never lose its importance. Now, if you have CPC, what should be the strategy? So the first question that usually anyone who starts preparing uh, will ask is that, ma'am, si ma what is a good um, uh, website to prepare? Ma'am, uh, what should be the approach? What all, you know, material? So let's let's go directly to the material. So my first to-go book or hand-go book is, hand. Uh, this is the most handiest thing ever. These are called as bare acts uh, without any touch. Pristine in its form, the way it was passed. In 1908, of course, there were amendments and they were added eventually, but these are called as bare acts. Why they are called as bare acts? Because they're just the acts, just the statutory provisions. There is no explanation, there are no commentaries involved. So if you have a CPC bare act, which also has some sort of commentary, I'm sure a lot of you must have heard the name of uh, uh, Mullah's CPC. So Mullah CPC does not just contains the bare provisions of CPC, but it also has explanations and commentaries. So for beginners or for novices who are venturing into uh, competitive exams preparation, I would never suggest you to touch Mullah because it can go really very heavy on you. And you need to understand that in the preparation of judicial services examination, what is important is what not to read because you have immense literature, you have immense jurisprudence available to you both online and offline. So you should categorically know what you're not supposed to read rather than what you're supposed to read. One bare act that is CPC and eventually develop the art of decoding CPC. So it might sound very daunting. They might sound very, you know, like uh, complicated, but they're actually very easy. In the most layman terms, it just means one simple thing. And whenever you read one basic textbook, just write down one word in front of that section and that would suffice whenever you are going through the revision. Now, another book, which is usually, uh, you know, most uh, widely accepted, both for uh, uh, both while you are in your law school or if you want to clear an examination, is CK Takwani, ABC's publication. You can take the seventh, eighth or ninth edition, whatever you feel like. So since commercial courts were added to, so there were certain changes and that is why amendments were made, uh, made. So you can take any latest edition of CK Takwani and I think that should suffice for your basic level preparation. Now, CPC, for example, is coming in here. So uh, let's, let's talk about the stages of examination. So for example, if you are preparing for DJS or Delhi Judicial Services, so if you are a resident of Delhi, or even if you're not a resident of Delhi, but you feel that, you know, it would be nicer to prepare for this state, whatever your reasons may be, just check out the syllabus first of all. Have a bare look at the syllabus and you'll eventually realize that almost for 400 marks, 200 marks have been given to CPC, uh, Law of Limitation, uh, Registration Act, all these papers, and then another 200 marks allocated to Criminal Procedure Court, IPC, and the Indian Evidence Act. So these papers are 
inevitable, very important. You cannot miss them. It is either a hit or miss. There is nothing gray in between. There has to be black and white. So you've got to choose your own dope. You need to know how to get started. And for that, first of all, just look the three stages through which this entire process goes. It's almost like for one, one and a half year, the procedure. So there are vacancies that are announced usually uh, by the Delhi High Court, if I'm giving you an example of DJS. So there's a preliminary examination which will have objective type of question, thereby meaning MCQs or multiple choice questions. So you'll be given four options and then you have to deduce them. You have to tick mark on one. And I think there is uh, a negative marking as well. It, uh, so even at the stage of preliminary examination, they do ask you questions from CPC, CRPC, constitutional law, IPC, evidence, contract, all these things. But focusing on CPC, yes, they do ask questions in prelims as well. Almost to the best of my understanding, they ask you around eight to 20, 10 questions, thereby meaning that you have to prepare this subject from first page to the last page. And uh, another best form of preparation is to have a 10-year bank. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of options available. I would never suggest you to go only for one particular book per se. But Universal Publication is also pretty nice. Uh, Universal Publication for uh, uh, Judicial Services uh, or DJS Examination is a very good book if you are preparing for DJS or Har Haryana Services for that matter. Uh, you can check the question bank. There's, of course, some sort of pattern which you will eventually realize while you are preparing that there are certain portions uh, with which, uh, you know, these uh, uh, um, 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 judiciary examination question makers are quite obsessed with. And every time they do ask you a question or two from that section, say, for example, section 10 or section 11, res judicata or res subjudice. So they do like asking you questions on this. So you've got to prepare thoroughly uh, uh, with the subject. Now, there are a lot of students who have this thing in their mind that let's prepare prelims ki tayari kar leta hon, pehle prelims, ho jai, uske baad mains ka dekhte hain. Never do that blunder. What am I saying is, I'm again going to repeat it, that a lot of students feel that, you know, either because of their uh, uh, fear or insecurities, they're like, okay, let's at least clear the prelims first and when, whenever the boat sails and we reach the stage of mains, then we'll have ample time, we'll prepare it. No, it, it is never like that. Your approach should be preparing for mains first and then you should come to prelims. Logically, prelims preparation should take at max two months when we are talking about law core papers. However, they also ask uh, general knowledge-based question papers or some questions from English, which you need to prepare round the clock over the year. So general knowledge is not one paper that you can prepare overnight. You have to read the newspapers. You, you must know what's going on in and around you. However, prelims preparation, to the best of my experience, is, should not take more than two months. However, mains preparation will take you at least six months, not before six months. So whenever you're planning to appear for judicial services, start preparing one year in advance. Your notes for judiciary mains examination should be prepared. There is no chance that you should miss on it. You should be prepared from, you know, lend to breath in this regard. Now let's come in, in case if you've cleared your prelims examination, you are usually given three, two and a half to three months of time before the mains examination. Now mains examination will also be conducted in several parts. So there are almost five to six papers. There's an English paper where you're expected to, you know, convert Hindi to English translation, um, English to Hindi translation, presses writing, um, um, you know, judgment writing. These, uh, this is paper one. Then there's uh, another paper of general knowledge. And uh, mains examination, uh, let me tell you, is subjective in nature. So it is basically going to judge you the way you are writing. So you've cleared the objective round. You're now at the stage of subjective examination. At the subjective level, they're going to ask you almost 50% of the weightage is given to the procedural laws. Why? Because your first posting, in case you are uh, appearing in Delhi, would be a metropolitan magistrate. Or in case if you are in some other state, you will become a judicial magistrate, second class or first class. Or alternatively, in the most common parlance, you will be sent to a civil diwani court or a diwani court, which is Kachehri. So Kachehri may Agar aap ja rahe hai, judge ban ke, probation mein, training ke baad, it is expected out of you, since you are becoming judge at a district court, 
where the trial happens and trial is nothing but procedural law. So it is expected out of you to be, you know, thoroughly acquainted with procedural law. And in fact, this is also somewhat problematic that uh, the judges at district court are so, you know, overwhelmed with the procedural aspect that sometimes they may miss out on the humanity angle or humanity aspect. So there are certain things which are very rigid in procedural laws due to which the judges do not have the flexibility to make interpretations and henceforth a litigant goes to a high court for better interpretation. But let's not get into that. All I'm saying is that you will be a wonderful judge if you know CPC better. And uh, we are not boasting about it. I've practiced in front of uh, Supreme Court, High Court and across various tribunals in Delhi. There are times when, you know, uh, probably I am 29, 30 years old and the judge who's recruited is just 21 years old, fresh out of college and within one and a half to two years, that person has, you know, presided the chair. So there was a latest amendment uh, or suggestion per se by the Bar Council of India, which suggested that many a times there is some sort of, you know, turbulence between the uh, judges and the lawyers that since we have seen practice in so many years, CPC theoretically and CPC practically are very different. So what we are trying to convince the judge, judge doesn't understand because he's just read the theoretical portion while that person was in the law school. So it becomes quite problematic. So BCI came with a recent suggestion or amendment that uh, anyone who's clearing a judicial service examination, it is expected that you should have at least two years of or three years of practice as a lawyer. So it comes with its own plus and minuses, but somehow I would always suggest you that if you have some sort of exposure with litigation, and even if you're not interning, wherever you are staying, whichever country, whichever state you are, just go to a nearby district court. Nobody's going to stop you. Go inside any random civil court, sit uh, where the litigants are sitting, like right in the end, and just analyze how the court works. What is this judge trying to do? What are the different types of matters that come? What is the procedure they are adopting? And you'll be amazed to understand that what you're reading theoretically and what happens practically are two very different things. Of course, this comes with a, uh, you know, um, as a lawyer's perspective, but we need to understand that it will always be nicer if you are not preparing uh, for CPC just with a, a thought that mujhe sirf paper exam karna hai mujhe judge banna hai. No, try to read more about it. Please subscribe to Bar and Bench, Law Beats, Live Law, you know, where a lot of nice articles are written on procedural law. Do read about them also. They give a lot of good interpretation, any particular section that was recently challenged, because it will give you a fair idea of how developments or amendments have taken place in the subject over the period of time. And uh, these, these, you know, bear acts were made way back in the year 1908. So it comes with its own perils. Some of the provisions are highly archaic in nature. And you will always make a cutting edge in your mains examination if you are writing um, with a top up in your answer. So everybody usually uh, takes uh, notes from the common books. So how uh, you are going to make a mark or how you can score better than others is what additionally you are adding to your answers. Everyone knows the problem. Everyone knows the issues that are associated with CPC or any question that they are asking you. Your endeavor should be to be, you know, acquainted with latest amendments. You should know what's happening in this paper. New judgments you should try to quote, landmark judgments. Many a time students, you know, verbatim write case laws which they have read in a book 10 years before. And they don't even know that these judgments are actually overruled. So you should refresh the memory. Don't just stick to one book, but try to gather as much information as you can from different sources, be it news, be it, you know, uh, uh, law portals, uh, newspapers. All these papers are a sum total of socioeconomic political things that are happening around us. So if you say CPC is only procedural, that would be wrong to say. CPC is both substantive and procedural because it does have several sections. So if they are asking you a specific, uh, in the mains examination, if they are asking you a categorical question on section 151, which is the inherent powers of the court, it is the most uh, uh, you know, widely used section by the lawyers and by the judges alike. So while this 
statute was made in the year 1908 of course they knew that they cannot encompass everything right now and it's an ever evolving world you know there are complexities things are changing over the period of time so there could be a situation where something is not written in uh, the procedural law at that point of time what would a judge uh, what would a judge do what would a litigant do what would an advocate do so for that we the, the you know these uh, law makers these drafting committee members came out with a very visionary uh, provision which comes in the form of section 151 that is inherent powers of the court so sometimes when you don't know as a lawyer as a judge as a litigant what procedural law you should invoke because there is no specific uh, provision relating to that you write down an application and uh, send it to the court in the form of section 151 that is inherent powers of the court court has an inherent power to decide upon any matter that is coming in front of them by applying their brains by applying their rational even if there is no procedure laid down in that regard in this particular cpc so you know cherry pick some of these nice provisions and read more literature on it section 80 is very very important what if it's a civil uh, 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 procedural law but there's also a provision in case a private person wants to sue a government or a government based organization what section will you incorporate the section is section 80 so the changes that have taken place what if you want to file a civil case against a government then you know you invoke section 80 and section 80 has beautifully evolved over the period of time what are the provisions when you are going for appeal can you actually go in appeal and there is a lot of commonality between administrative law constitutional law procedural law with cpc so if there is an ex parte proceeding where a court has you know moved forward in one particular case without even getting giving a chance to the opposite party it is called as ex parte proceeding logically it goes against the principles of natural justice which says that you know or the alterum partum should be there thereby meaning that no one can be condemned no one you know uh, you cannot decide a matter without hearing parties you know, the party has all the right to be heard so this is or the alterum partum but this ex parte proceeding goes against the principles of natural justice so how we have to maintain a semblance imagine the situation of a judge who is sitting there who is taking away snatching away right of a person that i'm not going to hear you and i'm violating your principles of natural justice and i will proceed ex parte what provisions are there what comes in the mind of judge before letting another party you know uh, use this particular provision <clears throat> what are summary proceedings what if you are a litigant who has no money whatsoever can can somebody take away this right that you do not have access to justice no the constitution of india the grand norm provides us the provision of article 39a which is legal aid and in corroboration to that cpc comes out with this thing that there is a proper provision for indigent people or for poor people or for pauper people that access of justice should not be denied and there is a special type of suit which is called as indigent suit by indigent people that is provided in cpc so if you are a poor person who does not have money to go court you can also be allocated a lawyer all you have to do is go in front of the uh, my laws and tell them judge sir mere paas paise nahi hai aap mujhe ek vakil de dijiye and after taking into consideration judge is going to provide you so to say this is just very procedural it is very difficult uh, you know it is very technical it is not like that it has overlapping with a lot of other subjects as well so if you are reading cpc just like a horse whose eyes are closed looking right in front i'm so sorry even if you clear your judiciary uh, even if you become a judge there can be chances that you know you're not ready to learn this subject or any subject of law per se is ever evolving in nature and that is why we do have amendments we are living in a very complex society where things are changing over the period of time so we need to adapt ourselves in such a situation where we are able to cope up with whatever changes are uh, brought forth in papers like these not just that another source which is beautiful is the law commission report so law commission reports have great jurisprudence it has great literature anyone who's interested in research also can you know take care of these law uh, reports and you can write down the recommendations that have been given of course it has its pros and cons now when you're writing your mains examination since i have a uh, 
prepared also and at the same time although i have not prepared for judiciary but i had friends who are thankfully now judges and i asked them their approach i would always regret why i did not uh, appear for the um, um, judicial services examination um, uh, at the uh, at the uh, magisterial level however there is also a provision of higher judiciary examination for which you are eligible if you have 7 years of practice something like that so you know the option is never closed you can appear it uh, for higher judiciary as well so the thing is that one common answer that most of my friends have said is that the answers that you are writing in mails the judges expect you so they are basically the judges who are checking or evaluating your copy they expect you to come out with solution centric answers everyone knows what's the problem everyone knows uh, uh, you know uh, what are the troubles that are associated or anything that they are asking you when they are saying discuss uh, you know um, um, uh, elucidate with examples explain they are leaving the ball in your court by saying that we expect you to come out with solutions you are not here to just decide between what is right what is wrong but also to come out with a interpretation so there's some sort of critical thinking that you need to develop over the period of time and you will always cut across other uh, evaluated scripts if you have written something additional to your answers so do subscribe to these websites that come up with uh, that 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 i that you know are acting as law news portals law beat is there um, um live law is there bar and bench is there and there are you know notifications regarding cpc or crpc <clears throat> any particular case that was overruled that was challenged on any particular section some learned advocate has given their own explanation to the same so these are my intakes for you all uh, advanced stages of preparation would always help you clear this hurdle and uh, all i can say is that first of all you need to set forth uh, yourself in the right direction you should know whether you really want to do it it's a great responsibility it's a beautiful profession it's not everything around having a sarkari gadi security bangla and you know lal batti or neeli batti but it's much more beyond that you are my lord you are determining uh, life of somebody so there is great ounce of gravitas around this profession great profession great you know responsibility i would say and decide yourself uh, start preparing well in ad advance focus on mains first and for interview you'll have a lot of you know um, um, youtube videos that uh, uh, toppers and you know not just success stories but failure stories are also given so when i look back uh sometimes back in those days i used to feel frustrated that oh my god i've given two to and a half years to this thing and i got nothing in return but now when i look back into uh, you know retrospect i feel that thank god failure happened to me i've been a topper throughout i could never taste what uh, failing like means in life and what failing like an examination means in life and it has given me the most beautiful lesson of being acquainted with subjects like these they are beautiful subjects and even if i could not clear examination i know the subject all by my heart and i'm very happy and content with the same so do watch videos of not just success stories but failure stories as well because it's absolutely normal and it's absolutely uh, you know valid to feel all sort of emotions in you and uh, thereby i put an in, end to my monologue watching at the uh, screen blank so if you have any questions please feel free to unmute yourself i'll be more than happy to answer english hindi whatsoever i'm so sorry i don't know any other language thank you yes i see anushka hi anushka uh hello ma'am i just wanted to ask that um i think you said that you regret not uh, appearing or something like that so is there uh, ma'am can you hear me yes yes i can hear you anushka please tell me Oh your my screen froze that's why um yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, i wanted to ask is there a age limit for appearing for these exams yes there is a age limit i haven't really checked right now but i believe it is uh 30 or 33 anushka i need to check uh, uh for judicial services examination maybe it's so for different categories for uh, generals for scsts there's a different age bracket 
uh, different states have different eligibility criteria. So in case you want to appear for Haryana Judicial Services, just visit the website of Haryana High Court and just check there what is the eligibility criteria. Or for that matter, you can just write down it, uh, on Google. I think I, it's, it's not that I cannot give, but of course, uh, why I said this thing, I regret not giving it back in those days is that now that I have a practice of seven years, it makes more sense to appear for higher judicial uh, services so that my seven years of practice will be taken into account. And in case if I clear HJS, there are strong chances that, you know, I will be sent directly to a sessions court and the chances of getting elevated to high court also increases. And if at this, at this stage, I clear a metropolitan magistrate or uh, examination, these seven years will not be taken into consideration. So it would be nicer that you choose at what stage you should. So early you get uh, selected, more chances of you going to uh, 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 high court or uh, you know being a district judge. So that's that's my intake. So I would definitely prefer in case if I at all plan uh, uh, giving an examination, that should be an uh, HJS examination and not a lower judiciary examination, Anushka. Okay, ma'am, just one more question. Yeah. So uh, is there an age limit for higher for appearing for the higher judiciary no, as well? A, there's, there's a eligibility criteria. They expect you to have, uh, I think it's seven years uh, into practice or as a judge, seven years into litigation or as a judge. So thereby the first designation that you get is not a metropolitan magistrate, but you usually after your probation become a court in the sessions uh, judge, which is which has more powers and session judge can try you know, um, um, matters which have punishment more than seven years in age. So that's a more powerful court in that uh, regards. Uh, so, ma'am, just one yeah. more question. Yeah. Uh, so ma'am, I am a first year student. I just joined Jindal four All weeks right. ago. All and right. I do feel a bit interested in judiciary because I have been attending all these lectures, all uh, right. judicial lectures. And uh, so uh, what, what should be my approach? Should I start preparing it in my last year or should I go for an LLM and then appear for judiciary? Okay, Anushka. So I take this question as a general question for let's believe a lot of students who are attempting or are planning to take a, a judiciary examination by the end of their uh, five years. So Anushka, if I was you, I uh, would for the next one to two years get my hands on with different types of laws. So I would not start preparing directly from my first year for judiciary examination. There is a logic because by the time you're in your fifth year, you'll feel worn out, you'll feel tired. The pace should pick up gradually. First of all, right now for you as a beginner or as a first year law student is to know the core papers of law, constitutional law, CPC, CRPC, evidence, IPC. These five papers is something which you should not you know, ignore at any given point of time and contract law, of course. These six papers, are very, very important papers. So, you know, first of all, get your hands with these papers. Try to learn the art of writing examination, do some sort of research. And only in your, I would say, you know, when, when two and a half years or say three years have gone by. And meanwhile, in these three years, try to do internship in a civil court, in a criminal court. So that even if you are not having a work experience after uh, finishing of your law school, you very well have an idea as to how these courts work practically. So I would definitely suggest you that for the next two years, your target should not be to, you know, from the first day itself, start preparing for judiciary, but at least chart down certain things in your mind. You should know the trajectory that you have to follow eventually. First, you should know that you have to do internship. Secondly, you should know which state or two, three states that you're focusing. I would ne never suggest you to appear for 10 states because every state has their own you know, uh, eligibility criteria have their own uh, way of pre uh, preparation. So don't get lost uh, by uh, taking too many uh, states in that regard. Because if you are, for example, appearing for Madhya Pradesh Judicial Services, you have to read a lot of local acts. If you are, um, you have to read the, uh, uh, you know, I think it's a Revenue Act or Land Acquisition Act for Madhya Pradesh. If you are appearing in uh, DJS, they expect you to know Delhi Rent Control Act, which is a local law. So they expect you to know local laws as well. So right now, it makes no sense, Anushka. For the two years, try to know what's happening around. However, do subscribe to Bar & Bench, Live Law, Law Beats, all these things, so that you know what's happening. And whenever you are being taught that subject, take it very, very seriously. Keep poking your professors, keep asking your professors all type of questions, so that maximum learning is done 
why you are reading this subject you know sometimes a lot of students complain that we do have professors who have not taught us properly in the most you know uh, simplistic language if i can put but it's, it's sometimes the situation is that you know a professor is very well uh, read you know high uh, um, um, achievements uh, a professor has high achievements all these things but probably they are not able to deliver or the students are not able to understand so if that happens uh, i don't know who can help you out but still your endeavor should be to stick to bare minimum bare acts that you have uh, uh, the textbooks that you have and keep asking your professor questions you know you can take uh, time from them and you can ask that i'm not able to understand this provision and i'm sure they're going to give you time so as of now anushka um, uh, long thing short i would suggest that uh, after 2 to 2 and a half years get stead and uh, uh, in that position of preparing for examination yes kushi uh, okay ma'am uh, ma'am just a follow up question if i may uh, anushka there are a lot of other people as well oh, if, uh, okay. i don't mind if you can write to me uh, my email id is uh, pragya at the rate uh, 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 jju.org so you can write down to me and i'll also like uh, leave my e- email id uh, in the chat box so you can ask your questions okay ma'am that works thank you so much yeah yeah mishka yes kushi hi i see your hands raised yeah uh, professor am i audible yes kushi you are oh uh, yes professor i just had like a different view because i've heard from some people that um, you know once you enter the profession and once you do crack judiciary and once you become like the first class or second class magistrate in the scope of your growth personally as a law student because you'll always be a law student a student of law wherever you are yes. the scope of your growth as a law student diminishes because I, because over the years like say you'll be stuck for like 9 10 years in that court there's a probability right so you will be faced with the same old matters and the same kind of matters and applying the same law okay so we got this from um, professor uh, from mr bharat chu he actually uh, came for a yeah, i know he's my colleague i know i know he came here for a seminar at jindal and the whole topic was that why he shifted to corporate law he was a partner at lnl and now he has his independent practice so when asked why did he leave the judi- uh, judiciary and what motivated him to enter into corporate law he stated that you know it it was monotonous for him and for 9 or 10 years he was in that profession he didn't really gain much like as he wanted to uh, 10 what years what your point is what is your view like would the growth be restricted how do you tackle that like of okay. course okay. a very the- genuine question kushi but i think the answer lies within the question that to each his own and i certainly feel that uh learnings never stop in your life as a lawyer also while i was practicing at the court you know as a woman you tend to get a lot of matrimonial matters uh i have done matters on uh, acid attack uh, gang rapes i have done matters on domestic violences i have practiced in the civil side criminal side and since i was in um, i i am a legal counselor at tehar jail also i used to get a lot of matters in and associated with women but trust me every matter has taught me something new as a lawyer i'm saying per se but if you're a judge can you say that it will become stale can you say that you know your learnings will stop i think it's very personal it's very personal khushi it depends what makes you happy so my passion if you ask me is both teaching and litigation litigation is my dope it you know just makes me so happy because i feel that with every matter i tend to learn different things even if the factual matrix more or less remains the same so now that of course uh, you know my my colleague mr bharat he can very well say, say that because he has um uh, cleared judicial he had cleared you know he got rank 1 in dgs and after uh, taking the training and all these things then he shifted to corporate so he might have his own reasons but i still believe that it's very personal it will it it depends upon you if you want to come out of your comfort zone if you are not that person who you know as a lawyer i i see um, uh, justice uh, uh, rohington nariman i see justice yu yu lalit um justice chandrachud at supreme court and i was very fortunate to practice in front of them and i believe with every new matter they've come out with something absolutely new what if they thought that we are getting bored i can't imagine what would have happened to the country so you know it brings great sense of responsibility to you i have never been a judge i couldn't clear it the examination so i can't really say khushi it would be nicer on my part ki main kisi ko bolu ki wo sahi hai ya galat hai but i certainly believe that it's i i personally if you're asking me i don't believe that learnings will ever stop 
Mr. Chandrachur has given some immensely amazing um, uh, judgments and, you know, uh, he has overruled some of his uh, father's judgment. So how things have changed over the period of time, this is what the art is. So you need to absorb law. You need to bring, you know, it, it's, just, it's not that even if you're in a court for 10 years, you can come out with great judgments, which in the times to come, see, uh, nobody is going to judge the judge, but the history will remember the judge. And that is the beauty of this profession, Kushi. <clears throat> yes, Aditya. Uh, Ma'am, I think Shubhangi had her hand up first, so you can ask her, I'll go after her. Okay, all right. Hi, Shubhangi. Uh, hi, Professor. Actually, the only question I wanted to ask was, so you said that uh, you weren't successful while uh, trying to read. So I wanted to ask, is it because, and you were a topper, as you said. So is it something that we need to maybe go for some classes or I don't know. Do we Are you saying just... for coaching? Yeah, like something like that. Do we need something like that? or uh, Because I mean, if like, as so Shubhangi, uh, yeah. since I prepared for IS examination and my optional was law, which does not have procedural law. Plus, unfortunately, since I was from Campus Law Center, Delhi University, maybe I wasn't that very sincere back in those days or maybe the fault in my stars, whatever, that uh, I could not understand CPC very well. It was only when I started practicing that I could appreciate the subject. I've never prepared for judiciary that I can say. However, I teach judiciary students. I've taught them with their uh, law as an optional because now I have, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, decently well acquainted with CPC and CRPC. So to, uh, so I would always say that uh, coaching is not mandatory, not at all. However, it is not problematic as well. One year you are focusing completely because when you're doing your classes in the law school and I've seen a lot of my friends clearing judiciary without any proper uh, coaching. So coachings are not mandatory. However, when you are in your law school, you have other subjects as well. You know, you keep focusing on other research papers, you have deadlines, this and that. So for that one year, if you're doing a coaching, it will, you know, very intensely give you a quick uh, refreshing of all the law papers, all the important law papers that you've come across. And henceforth, I would never say that don't go for uh, coachings. Coachings are, you know, making money, this and that. It's a corporate model. If you can afford very well, you can go to a coaching, do some research. I would never hear, I'm not here to suggest you which coaching is good. I'm not a spokesperson of any coaching per se. But since I have taught also, all I want to know is that try to do a little research upon the background of the coaching that you are endorsing so that, you know, it's, it's not a small amount, one and a half to two lakhs you are spending in coaching plus one year of time. So you can start in the fourth or fifth year of your college, uh, this coaching, and by the end of the year, you might be ready with all the papers and then you have to quickly start revising. So it can be very intensive. You might feel frustrated at times, but it's not mandatory at all. It totally depends upon you. However, if I was you, Shubhanki, I think I would have gone for a coaching. I would not deny that because while we are in our law school, we tend to do a lot of other things as well. And it's still not mandatory. If you are confident, I think there's a lot of online uh, available uh, material which you can access and you would never have a trouble clearing examination. However, one thing is that no coaching can... Ma'am, you're on mute. You can, can you now hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I was saying that even if you're in your first year, try to read newspapers. Newspapers will help you a lot while you're preparing for mains examination. Uh, the Hindu and the Indian Express are two newspapers which are pretty decent editorial wise. Yes, Aditya. Aditya, can you hear me? 
uh, yes ma'am good afternoon yeah. um as far as i understand these uh, judicial service examinations are held state wise under the supervision of the respective high courts right Absolutely. but and also understand that a proposal for an all india judicial service examination has been in the work for some time right so could you just tell us what would be the advantages of that happening and whether it could realistically be implemented anytime soon See, so just like I said in the beginning, Aditya, the idea was first proposed in the 14th Law Commission report way back in the year 1958. And you know, uh, uh, time and again, but then we had the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, which is called as the mini um, uh, Constitution, where another article altogether was incorporated. That is Article 312, uh, Subsection 1, if I'm not wrong, which says basically that uh, you know Rajya Sabha is empowered to create a All India Judicial. Uh, service examination. Now, there's a lot of politics around it. There's a lot of inside stories because many a times they say that the administrative side or the bureaucracy would never want somebody to come at power with them, at par with them. And henceforth, you know, there's a strong resistance from within that there should not be all India judicial uh, uh, services because they still believe that uh, to keep uh, the check or and excesses of executive and legislature, we have judiciary. What if we empower judiciary to such an extent that we have a combined all India judiciary examination? Uh, there can be a lot of negative nuances, which you know bureaucracy feels that it might have, which can be true, which not not might be true. But I believe there are a lot of pros and pros, especially as law student, uh, if you are looking, because the problem is that right now, if you see, every state has its own you know tattered and haywire way of. Uh, uh, conducting these examination, there's not a proper channel, there's not a proper time period that is designated. So the issue is that a lot of students appear in multiple judiciary examination of different states. And since every state have their own ways, different approaches, it becomes very difficult uh, to keep pace because you have to read a lot of local laws and you're not able to focus per se. And it's not wrong because if you're appearing for three judicial examination of three different states, for example, say UP, Haryana and Delhi, it is quite problematic for you because all these three uh, states have very different approaches. They expect you to write down answers and means in a certain format. DJS is pretty evolved, it's very different. And however, in UP, there's a more focus on the general knowledge part. So it can be very, you know, um, it, it's quite cluttered right now. So if we have all the more uh, for IS examination, there's a proper notification by UPSC. There's a time period that is prescribed. There's a number of vacancy that is prescribed. So things are transparent. So they know that in this year, forms will be out in, uh, for example, say March, then there will be a, a preliminary examination in June, then there will be a mains in October, and then you know in the next year, there will be a, uh, preliminary, uh, there will be an interview. So at least things are systematic. There's a proper structure. However, it is not the same in judiciary. So I remember three, four years back, the UP uh, uh, judiciary came out with notification um, after three years. So for three years, there was no exam altogether. So if, if there were students of UP Carter, they were, you know, uh, you would always prefer giving your state examination relatively to other states because, you know, you're acquainted with the system. You would want to be around your folks. So this used to become a problem. So uh, it came out with, say, hooping 500 vacancies. But then what they did that in order to compensate, there were like 500 vacancies, one at a time, we're not going to do. So let's divide. Let's, you know, consecutively for the next three years, come up with 200 vacancy, 200 vacancy and 100 vacancy. So it's a little haywire. So I believe if we have an all India judiciary examination, a lot of students who are at the prime or they're at their youth would not, you know, waste their years and years because you are giving examination. Imagine you've given an interview, you're waiting for your results, and you're again at the same time preparing for your preliminary examination in the next round. So you're just somewhere in between there. So either it's a congratulation or that you have to prepare for prelims examination all again. So there's a lot of frustration, a lot of, you know, mounting pressure and you feel, you start feeling like a failure. And I've seen a lot of students in old Rajinder Nagar or Karol Bagh where these coachings are, you know, they, they, they become frustrated because prime or youth of their age has gone preparing in these negative examinations. So I believe AIJS is an altogether uh, go ahead uh, uh, as it should be. And I certainly believe that in the times to come, we will have a AIJS. Mother, like I, my, my heart says, my prediction says whatsoever. Yes, Parikshit. 
Yeah, good afternoon, Professor. Actually, I wanted to get your opinion on this. That uh, is it better to directly get into judiciary, like once you graduate from law school, or like is it better to have say two or three years worth of experience to better understand the practical aspect of law or how the courts work? So a lot of law colleges, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, state judiciary examinations allow uh, students who are in their fifth year to appear. So the eligibility becomes open to you. ever since uh, you are in your fifth year okay but of course they would want you that by, when when whenever uh, like finally whenever you've completed uh, you've cleared the is uh, judicial examination you must have your degree so the more early you start better chances of getting elevated because in judiciary everything comes with age so you know with age you get promoted you with age you get promotions so that is uh, something which is very good and henceforth Uh, i would never deter you by saying that uh, don't appear at all however i would definitely suggest that your preparation should be so strong so structured and systematic that 90% probability that you should clear in your first attempt in the very first go itself and baki they are going to train you in the you know training institute the judicial training academies however how you can make the most of these five years while you are in your law school is that do internship not just for the sake of doing but you know for your own self and nobody stopping you to the to go to the court so you'll get some idea as to how things happen inside the court which is very essential even if you're not an intern nobody will stop you from going to a court go there sit on the litigant side behind spend two hours so when i started practicing at the supreme court and you know i now keep telling people that i started with supreme court and then i started practicing in other courts my best experience uh, or my you know best uh, Uh, um, uh, learning experience has actually come from the trial court because supreme court is an appellate court you don't really get a lot of chance to you know debate or make your points you have very limited period of time however if you go to a district court from day one from you know from the scratch you are very well aware what is head to toe of that matter if you are at all joining any office any litigation office law clerk ko pakdo apne office ke jo clerks hote hain unke sath jao you know learn these people are uh, visionary even the senior advocates are dependent upon these people because they do not know that a small technical uh, error that somebody if you have not filed a court fees and even if the suit has you know uh, at the stage of trial where you know the judgment has to be delivered if the opposite party knows that the court fee was calculated wrongly or if there is a wrong error regarding the jurisdiction your matter is liable to be dismissed so that is the beauty which will only come with some sort of practical experience so if at all you can practice after your uh, law school for one or two years that will be the most amazing thing after that you can start preparing for judiciary and please check the uh, eligibility age eligibility criteria of the respective state where you are preparing thank you professor so it's 1 o'clock uh, if there's anybody who has a question i see some of the questions in the chat box um khati says i'm a final year blb student i'm aiming to pursue pcs j in the near future now i'm also planning to do my llm after graduation and simultaneously prepare for the judicial services is it beneficial to have an llm uh, degree before pursuing the services see uh, llm uh, so you know like i practiced for 5 years after that i took the risk of doing an llm so a lot of people were shouting and i was partner with one of the firm so they were like have you gone nuts you know you are going to give back your matters again um judicial you know litigation has nothing to do with llm but i always had that quest of learning because i believe that learning should never stop and i certainly believe that after getting a global exposure at cambridge after coming back as a teacher and whenever if at all i join back the profession i will definitely be a better person my uh, arguments have gone better because there's some sort of depth of knowledge the best thing that i've learned in my llm uh, and all thanks to cambridge is that they've inculcated some sort of critical thinking in me so you know i have started questioning i don't look things from others perspective but now at this point thankfully i also have a perspective so it is never a problem if you're doing a llm never even once in your life doubt that any degree is a waste degrees are never a waste they are much better than artificial ornaments they are much better than you know they are you more than diamond more than gold that's all i have to say professor uh, we have 
three more questions i can see only if you have time otherwise we can uh, what we can do is we can direct those questions to you on that would be, uh, that would be great if that hap uh, happens yes. because i have a person waiting at my door that there's a zomato delivery i um, see i see professor in which case professor thank you so much for spending uh, your time with us especially on a no problem no problem sunday and professor i i did uh, the the lecture which is from failure you can learn a lot of things at least from failure you can learn a few ways in which you should not proceed so i that is that is a beautiful note professor thank you so much for being thank here with so us much. today thank you so much thank you so much trupti and you can also add me on twitter i am available with @parijatpragya directly dm me your question i am super active on twitter